Marcel will kind of help us guide through this maze of artificial intelligence in his talk, uh, Generative AI and the War on Fakes. He mentioned my day job. I do have a night job as well, which is trying to explain how technology works, trying to make people understand what the impact of using technology is. And so we will be having like a kind of a to the force around AI and what that means, maybe to your customers, maybe to your business, but at least understand what's coming up there because transparency is what we need. And transparency is what I will hopefully try to be able to give to you, pass on to you. So you probably have seen this picture and you probably know that it's fake, but what happens do you know this picture? Who thinks it's fake? According to BBC, it's fake. Um, and if you look at these faces, for example, why are they not looking at the fugitive? Uh, these faces look pretty weird as well. They don't look like humans, but like kind of some aliens. Uh, um, probably these legs are not made for walking and, and he will probably fall behind kind of, at least I would probably stumble or look at these feet, which direction are they going? Who do they belong to? So yes, it probably is fake. Uh, to understand what's going on, we'll go a little bit into AI history and then look at how, for example, ChatGPT is working. Who of you already knows how ChatGPT works internally? Three, okay. So for the others, uh, you will learn something new and then also we will learn how things work, why things work and why things fail and how that is being abused. And in the end, how we can reestablish trust. AI, in my opinion, started some 100,000 years ago when people started cooking meat or cooking food in general. At around the same time, our brain started growing. And as you probably know, your brain is consuming 10% of your daily energy. So that additional 10% somehow needed to be justified. So hunting and gathering needed to be better. So while the brain grew at that time, later on, we were extending it. We were starting to communicate and pass information over space and time using written documents, uh, starting um, uh, then into the web, trying to increase our mental capabilities, our mind model, the information that we have. And now we have this AI and some people say that we'll be replacing the humans. Some say that this is a good idea. I don't think that they will replace us, but at least we need to be careful about them. And we need to know what's going on. So if we look at, for example, the last 60 years of, of AI, um, we started with what's called the expert systems, uh, where we had some rules and Eliza, an artificial uh, psychotherapist, uh, started in the 1960s. And you could exchange a few sentences with Eliza, and it seemed like it could be a real psychiatrist. But after a few sentences, a few exchanges, you notice that, yeah, things are kind of following a pattern there. You could recognize patterns. So AI was pretty easy to be distinguished and, and recognized at that time. People started creating programming languages just for the, of simplifying this if-then statements. Uh, but as you probably know, computer scientists, some of you are probably computer scientists, or I hope all of you know some computer scientists. Um, computer scientists are inherently lazy. Whenever it comes to repetitive work, they try to avoid it. They abhor it. So anything that can be automated, let's automate it. Why create those rules if probably the computer can create those rules as well? So we started inventing neural networks. We started working with probabilities and filtering the big data and try and crumble and mix that. And to some extent, hey, some good results came out of that. So what actually started there was that we started 
mixing this machine learning part and um, and statistics um, and it turned out to be the, the analytic kind of AI that was dominant for the past few decades. Uh, analytic as maybe a, a contrast to the generative AP, AI that we have today. Analytic AIs are everywhere. So if you own a car, you probably have that uh, recognition system for, for street signs. And for example, my car always mistakes this as a sign that this is at most 40 kilometers an hour. It's round, it has a 40 in it, fine. Um, or you've probably seen some other mistakes. Uh, this uh, very extensive Swiss cow, which is uh, used for producing the long cheeses as well. Um, things go go wrong sometimes but we have also like natural artificial intelligence for example this stuff was uh, trained using the same mechanisms that we use for training ai whenever it recognized uh, the piece of um, tissue this is uh, medical tissue samples when it correctly recognized them it got the reward if not no reward. So it was trained to recognize uh, um, uh, unhealthy tissue uh, in human bodies. But AI is also lazy. It inherits that from the computer scientists. For example, uh, the red part in this figure is what is important in recognizing uh, this horse. And you probably would look at it it's nice now, the, the beautiful ears, the curvy back. No, the copyright uh, statement is what the AI here learned. And because it's trying to minimize relationships, it tries to optimize changes in the different parameters. And what it ends up is essentially creating correlations. When I see this copyright remark, uh, it's a horse. And if you look at, for example, the top right graph there, you will see that uh, there is another correlation out there. For example, the people who drowned in swimming pools in the US strongly correlated with the number of uh, films Nicolas Cage appeared in that year. Probably that's a correlation. At least that's what we think it is. Nobody of us would ask uh, Nicolas Cage to appear in fewer movies uh, to reduce the number of drownings. We know that there is probably no causal relationship, that there is just a correlation. We sometimes forget it when looking at statistics, but this is what happens. And AI just finds these correlations. It does not know whether Nicolas Cage is responsible for actually drowning people in pools. So, but now we look at, at AI. What, what has ChatGPT be trained with? So if it has been trained about 80% of its training input is internet stuff, either directly from an internet crawl or referenced by Reddit, and then two book collections of obscure origin. And uh, these 3% down here, yes, this is 3% of, of the surface area, um, is uh, somehow edited uh, uh, data from Wikipedia. So what we do is we shred this information, extract some statistics, pass this around the world to some people in Kenya who look at those texts and then decide whether they're good or bad. And there is a um, recycling happening there. And when we ask a question here, it just tries based on the statistics to complement or complete that question. We will look into more details there. And yes, uh, most of these AI companies reserve the right to take your questions uh, as new training material. So what we, do we have? Actually, ChatGPT and most of these lo other large language models are just text completion tools. They don't answer questions. They don't have knowledge. They just try to extract patterns um, from this shredded internet text. And the output they create is based on the frequency of the occurrence of, of some characters, how likely they follow each other. And then they modulate that by these statistical patterns that they learned. And 
each output is random and there is no planning ahead of time. There is no big master plan when writing an answer. Um, the GPT family, you probably know, the G stands for generative large language model based on transformer, a technology that was created some six years ago by Google uh, engineers in a paper called Attention is All You Need, and we will talk about attention and transformers uh, more lately. And it's not just the model, but it has been pre-trained, pre-trained here with internet text. And for our example, where we will do a deep dive into how ChatGPT works, is we'll take a Shakespeare text, roughly a megabyte of Shakespeare text, and we'll try to train the model on recreating some Shakespearean or Shakespeare-like texts. Um, so it is trained with the pattern from the text, and the simplest patterns is what character so so we're looking at nano gpt right now this is like a final a small version of of uh, chat gpt we'll extend that later how high the probability is that after the t an h and i or an e follows after an h and i and s or a t follows these are the most likely combinations there and our first step is this not really convincing example of shakespearean literature but it's just modeled on that simple pattern. After a T, a C, a T we have very likely have an H with some uh, smaller probability we have I's or E's. Of course, that single character dependence is not strong enough to create the real human sounding text. So what we do is use that attention mechanism, that magic attention mechanism that underlies all of these transformer mechanisms, which is essentially an extremely compact representation of some relationships between previous characters and the current character. An extremely compressed information, extremely lossy, extremely bad, but still extremely helpful. Hey, it almost looks like words now. There are, you will recognize several English words and several others who almost look like English words. And uh, of course, because it's not perfect, we add more of that imperfect technology. And yeah, most of these words could be English words now. Um, we add a neural network to combine the outputs of several of these transformer systems, of these attention mechanisms. Um, and it gets gets more and more English sounding. Um, in the uh, as part of the computation, there are some large numbers that appear. We just cut them off essentially. Uh, and during training, we tell the system not to learn all that we teach it. We tell it to ignore ten percent of the learnings every time, roughly. That adds some magic to it, that adds some spice. Because we don't want to replicate Shakespeare text one-on-one, -on -one, we could have done that much easier. We want to have Shakespeare-inspired text. And the similar thing is, in the end, we want some internet-inspired answers. And hey, what do we get out of this? Combining several statistical means, the top in the world by suffering grace. Lucio says, we muse has resisted him so severe. Somebody could talk that on the stage and, and you might even applaud him at the end. Um, so, hey, we have Shakespeare created from our simple statistical models. And as I already mentioned, the training data sh uh, sh is shredded. Uh, it starts in the middle of a world, ends probably in the middle of a world, world. No problem is that it is able to combine that. And every output is random because if you would only take the most likely character after each one, the most likely character after a T is an H, after an H is an E, after an E is an R, after an R is an E again. So you would have pretty boring text and nothing Shakespeare-like. So we need the randomness in there, which also adds to the uncertainty. So GPT-3 has much longer, uh, much bigger training data, much more parameters than we created in our uh, sample. But it still only essentially writes and completes its own text. But with some trick, we can tell it to complete our own text. And this is essentially the main training that happened in the uh, towards ChatGPT. 
that it still does not answer questions, but it can complete questions with answers. It's trained with question answer pairs. And so it tries to complete uh, these and using human feedback learning, it, some of these uh, FAQs were created, many of them automatically because, you know, computer scientists are lazy. So now you know how AI works and it's not really trustworthy, the output, but of course the output could also be fake. Again, here we have a Monet painting, uh, so a Mondrian painting. Who thinks this is an original, a picture of an original Mondrian painting? No, but one. <laughs> okay. Are you just doing it for, for the challenge? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, we know that Mondrian used much clearer black uh, uh, lines, but hey, at the first sight, it looks, it could be a Mondrian painting. Um, and people might even buy it and, and hang it on their walls. So how would we recognize whether this is a fake painting or a real painting? Um, so we could do image forensics. People have been doing that for some time. We could look at AI particularities. We could look at these feet that we have seen there, or another one is that some fingers, uh, some hands have six fingers and stuff like that. Um, we could try to compare images with exact matches or using similarity search and try to identify them and or using watermarking. Um, the same thing we could do with text and we have been doing that for years in plagiarism research. You have maybe been following the examples of, of German politicians who didn't write their PhD thesis on their own. And I wrote most of my PhD thesis myself, actually, um, except the parts that I labeled that I didn't write myself. And, and you also have some AI particularities there. You have some text patterns that the words are pretty common. The sentence structure is relatively normalized, but we don't know that ahead of time. And finding out about that is a, a manual process. We don't want manual processes. We are lazy. We are computer scientists, or we know computer scientists. So let's look at, at what these, whether these other three techniques, which could be automated, can help us. So for example, this image, um, was also generated by AI. Um, and yes, we could try and recognize it one-on-one, -on -one. but what happens if you crop that image? For example, you require it in a 16 by nine uh, form factor, and then the checksum would be very different. Or you tint it, you change the colors, you change the appearance and so on. It's still essentially the same image, but all those hashes, all those digital signatures would completely fail. So people have been working on similarity search, trying to identify uh, images, whether they are modifications, cropped, rotated, and so on, whether they have the same features. And you see that nice dog on the right-hand side? I'm a dog person. But that cat on the other side is also considered to be exactly the same image by some of those similarity um, algorithms. You see that there is some noise in there, and that's part of trying to make that into a cat and to turn that into a dog. So similarity search can easily be circumvented. So if you want to match images, you cannot trust those similarity search mechanisms. Yes, we could use some kind of watermarking. For example, those who have worked with, uh, um, uh, with Dali, know this five color pattern there, or if you look at the image information, somewhere in the metadata of the image, it tells you that it has been generated by uh, DALI or as they call it, OpenAI Labs. Um, and, but this information is easily cropped out or metadata removed, so how could we do that? And essentially there is a kind of a claim about watermarking that either the watermark is, is easily visible, distorting the image, like a big white stamp over the image, or it is erasable or verifiable. 
but you cannot have all three of them. Especially just assume that you have a public image verification service and you have an AI created image and you want that AI created image to be identified. What happens then? If I can upload my image there and it tells me, hey, yes, with 98% probability or with 15% probability, this is AI generated. I will change a few pixels, submit it again, and suddenly it is more or less likely. So I can easily defeat, as soon as we have public mechanisms to identify AI, we have public created uh, public mechanisms to defeat that mechanism at the same time. So that doesn't work either. If you go back to text, there are some mechanisms that have been proposed and that look at the surface, they look pretty good. Um, so half of the words or half of the tokens that we generate are labeled green. We randomly put them into a green group. We randomly put them into a red group. For example, the would be red and a would be green for and so on. And, and cow would be red and calf would be green and so on. And then you would apply when you generate text based on a secret formula, if two tokens, one red, one green, are almost have a similar likelihood to be created as the next token, you would use that secret function to make the red or green slightly more likely. So we could create um, a mechanism like that to generate uh, text. So for example, here, this text has pretty much mixed the red and green. And here we have mostly, we have slightly preferred the green words in, in that research. And so this is very unlikely that it will only have green words, but as you require a lot of text, and if you don't have a lot of text, the quantity will degrade quite a bit. And we have seen the techniques that we used for uh, plagiarism, avoidance, changing to synonyms, swapping before the and or or, changing an and to an or, a the to an a, and so on, will completely uh, erase the effectiveness of that. And again, if we have a public verifier, we could just plug and play and play around with the text um, until we're happy. So what we do we need? So we do not have any of those technological solutions can reliably identify fakes. So we need some other way of showing that our text or our data is probably not fake. So I call it the first mover advantage. So whoever has a first document should label it, should timestamp it at some point to say, hey, I've seen that document at that particular time, uh, uh, point in time. So we would need uh, to create a record when we um, create an image first. For example, whenever a camera takes a picture, it should be uh, labeled and timestamped. Whenever a photo manipulation app, text editing app, and so on, modifies that text, it should re uh, record a track record. It should be able to use link that to the user that made the change, and it should uh, link it to the documents that were included. So if you copy pasted some text, or images that should be uh, recorded so that we have a track record and we have the possibility to selectively re reveal which parts were created from which original contact, and especially the selective revealing process is there. And this is now where finally technology and signatures and hashes come into play, the things that you have all been waiting for. Um, so we create the document hash, we create the user ID, we create a list of those references to the other documents that we have been using, and we add a nonce for privacy purposes. Then we hash that at the time and sign it. And what we do uh, put into public repositories is the hash and the time and the signature that was created, and the pink parts will keep private until we are challenged to reveal that. We don't need to reveal all of our documents there. Um, so yeah, we have the timestamp here and, and for those that are into software development will notice that this kind of reference, um, 
having those references looks like a, a Git repository to some extent, but it has the ability to reveal information only um, selectively. And how do we do that? We could store that in a blockchain. If you already have a blockchain, that's fine. Just creating a blockchain for timestamping is, is pretty much overhead because you're doing a lot of uh, consensus mechanisms, which you don't need uh, in, in digital signatures. You could do cross timestamping or, or similar techniques that were already invented in the 70s. Or uh, obviously, uh, you could use HSMs and uh, as, as you're all into HSMs, this is probably going to be uh, your favorite solution. So, yeah, you learned quite a bit about the HSMs. Uh, no, no, sorry, you didn't learn them. <laughs> Excuse me. You learned a little about the HSMs, but you learned about new applications and, and you know about the challenges that some of your customers might be having. And now you might even have a way to deal with that challenge and make your customer happy. And I think... If I reach, uh, reach that goal, that uh, would make me happy. So if you want to learn more about how AI works and how it doesn't, uh, on this webpage, mostly German texts, but not only. And otherwise, you have your favorite AI to translate it to English or whatever is your favorite language. Thank you very much. <laughs>